Hello, and thank you very much for joining us tonight. I'd like to introduce tonight's speaker, Dr. Wes Ketchum. Before coming to Fermilab full-time as a scientist five years ago, Wes studied supernova at the University of Oklahoma and later dug through high energy particle interactions at the Fermilab Tevatron while working on his PhD from the University of Chicago. In addition to analyzing data from our detectors, he helps design the systems to, to collect the data, focusing on data acquisition for neutrino experiments like Microboon, Icarus, SBND, and Dune. Some of you may recognize Wes as the winner of our 2014 Physics Slam, where he showed his claymation simulation of detector behavior. Welcome back, Wes. Hi, thanks very much, Dave. And hi, everybody. Uh, hope you're all having a good evening. Uh, thank you for, uh, for coming out virtually um, and uh, uh, coming out to support uh, art and science at Fermilab. So, uh, so yeah, so let's, uh, let's jump into it. So today um, I'm going to talk about how, how to record a ghost um, or in more detail getting data out of a particle physics detector. Um, so as Dave said, I'm Wes Ketchum, so, and I'm a scientist here at Fermilab. Uh, so you should be, I hope, asking straight away, uh, wait, particle physics try to record ghosts? That doesn't make any sense. Uh, that uh, doesn't sound like science. And of course, no, that's not quite what we're talking about. Um, I'm going to talk about something I actually think is probably a bit stranger than ghosts, uh, and which is instead neutrinos. Uh, so, uh, so let's get into it though, uh, and work our way up to there. So what is a neutrino? Uh, before saying what a neutrino is, let's describe a bit more about uh, the matter and the world around us. So uh, as many of you probably remember, uh, if you look out into everyday things and look and see what matter is made of, kind of pick anything you'd like. Uh, one of my favorite things, of course, is coffee. Um, and, uh, and the caffeine in it. Um, and so th that's, uh, those are made of molecules. Uh, you know, the caffeine molecule here is a, uh, uh, is a mix of, uh, of carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, and hydrogen elements. Um, so you'll hopefully remember from your, uh, from your high school chemistry class, you know, the periodic table of the elements. Um, and hopefully you'll also remember that each of those elements uh, are individual atoms. Uh, and each of those individual atoms on top of that is a collection of uh, protons and neutrons that form the nucleus of those atoms, and then electrons that orbit around that nucleus. And uh, maybe something you didn't cover in, in high school science, but, but many of you probably, uh, probably know if you've been uh, around Fermilab for any uh, amount of time, is that uh, protons and neutrons themselves aren't fundamental particles, that they're, they're made up of what are called quarks. Um, and each of them are made up of two different types of quarks, uh, up quarks and down quarks. Protons are made up of two up quarks and a down quark, and neutrons uh, the reverse, two down quarks and an up quark. Um, but each of them is three quarks, and then they're all kind of glued together as part of the, uh, as part of the atom, uh, atomic nucleus. So uh, that's kind of the, you know, the fundamental particles that sort of make up uh, much of the everyday world around us. And then, of course, there's the forces uh, that uh, make up uh, how uh, those particles interact with each other. Um, there's, of course, gravity, uh, which uh, is something that still kind of remains puzzling to us from a particle physics perspective. Um, but the other forces that are well known and fit well within our theories in particle physics, um, electromagnetism, and so the, and the photon that mediates that force is something that uh, many of you uh, know and love well. Um, and then uh, there's the strong nuclear force and weak nuclear force. So the strong nuclear force is, is responsible for uh, holding the, those quarks together as part of the, as part of the nucleus, um, mediated by what are called gluons. And we'll talk a bit more about the weak nuclear force because uh, that's, uh, that's where neutrinos really come into play. Now, okay, but before we get there, uh, it's a not quite that simple. Um, so those are the those are kind of the particles that are the most familiar to us. But each of those particles has uh, two uh, heavier cousins. Uh, so the up quark has a heavier version called the charm quark in the in the top, 
the down the screen, the heavier version is called the strange in the bottom. And then the electron ha also has its heavier cousins, the muon and tau. But other than being a bit heavier um, and uh, you know, being able to, because of their heavier, being able to have different sort of decays and, and things available to it, uh, they're, they're largely the same uh, as, as the up, down, and, uh, and electron that we know so well. Um, and then probably, as many of you know, each of those particles has its own antiparticle, sort of its mirror image of it. And so just like we have an electron, then there's an anti-electron, or often what we call a positron, because it has a positive charge. Um, and there's a, a anti-muon, anti-tau, and anti-up quark, and, and all and all the rest as well. Okay, so what is a neutrino? We haven't even touched on that yet, and that's what uh, that's what we're going to really be talking about for much of this talk. Um, so let's do a little bit of history and go back to around the beginning of the uh, around the end of the 19th century and beginning of the 20th century. So. Um, problems uh, in looking at the very early uh, physics and radioactive decays, and particularly things called beta decays. So uh, scientists at the time uh, saw and noticed that neutrons uh, within the atom didn't always seem to be stable, and that there are uh, these radioactive decay happens, which were mediated and, and sort of described, later understood to be described by the weak nuclear force for these beta decays. And what would happen is that you would have a neutron within part of the atom uh, would seemingly decay and uh, change into a proton and emit an electron. And usually that proton would stay inside of the atom, uh, atomic nucleus, but the electron would then escape out. And so uh, physicists, when, when, they saw, when they saw this at the time, they were thought it was very intriguing. And so they started to make, uh, they wanted to make measurements of you know, what the electrons look like as they came out of this atom uh, from these decays. And the idea was if, that, uh, if, that the, if you measured the energy of the electron, then it should have the same energy every time that you, that you measured it, which would just be uh, the difference in mass between the neutron and proton. And that just kind of goes back to you know the old Einstein equation e equals mc squared. So the neutron's a little bit heavier than uh, than the proton, and so that difference in mass makes some energy available to to the electron, and that's what the electron should sort of take out of the nucleus. And since uh, energy should be conserved, the electron should always have uh, have that same amount. But uh, when they measured, they didn't see sort of a constant energy. Uh, like you would see on the, like you might expect to see on the bottom right with this sort of, sort of a spike in, in where the electron kinetic energy was. Instead, there's a whole spectrum of energies uh, that were uh, never greater than that, but often much less. Um, and so uh, the, uh, this was, this missing energy was very, was, was very puzzling. And so, uh, so you kind of have two options at this point. You can either say, well, energy is not conserved, or you can say there has to be something else going on. And uh, physicists uh, decided that you know, the, the nicer solution would be to, to believe that there's a new kind of particle, which got eventually called the neutrino, and that, that there must be this particle because otherwise you, you wouldn't be able to conserve the energy and momentum. Uh, that would break all of the other physical laws that we had. So this prediction that this neutrino must exist came in 1930 and, uh, uh, and was finally actually detected uh, 26 years later. Um, so it took a long time to actually uh, get positive proof that this, that this new particle existed. But, uh, but after, uh, after some heroic efforts to make these measurements, uh, uh, it was experimentally confirmed that yes, indeed, there is this extra particle that's carrying away uh, some of this energy and that it's part of these decays. So, um, so we can add neutrinos to our list now. So of, of the fundamental particles that we know about. So we have this nice green, uh, green uh, row uh, in our fundamental particle list. And of course, if there's an electron, uh, if there's a neutrino um, and it's uh, uh, associated to the electron, uh, then there's probably other kinds of neutrinos associated to the muon and, and tau. And in, indeed, uh, those were discovered in time as well. Um, and each of those, 
uh, each of those neutrinos, of course, then also has its own uh, anti-neutrino, just like, just like everything else. So a little bit about neutrinos. I mean, the, it's, it's interesting that they uh, were discovered uh, in, so late, but neutrinos are actually everywhere. So they're, they're a byproduct of nuclear reactions and decays, like I, I talked about before, uh, coming from the weak, uh, the, the, the weak force. Um, and as it turns out, trillions of them stream through us all of the time. So from uh, nuclear fusion in the sun, uh, that gives off a lot of neutrinos that then uh, travel through uh, space and time all the way to us and then and then just uh, and then through us. Uh, the, from particle interactions in our atmosphere, uh, cosmic, uh, cosmic rays when they're created by you know, uh, charged particles hitting uh, energetically hitting the top of our atmosphere and the cascade of particles that comes comes down from those include a lot of neutrinos. They're even produced in the explosion of stars. So these are, you know, uh, called supernova. Um, and th those will produce a, a, a lot of neutrinos, um, uh, though uh, at, a, at a big distance from us. And there's even neutrinos that are from the remnants of the Big Bang. And even in everyday, you know, everyday day-to-day -day life, there's a lot of uh, isotopes of atomic elements that are uh, that undergo nuclear uh, decays and uh, produce these neutrinos as well. And so from uh, uh, one of my favorite ones is uh, from a banana. Bananas have potassium and there's a isotope of potassium that, that will decay. And the number of neutrinos per day per banana is about a million. So, uh, so these, are, these neutrinos are everywhere. Um, but they are very hard to detect. So they only interact through the weak force. They have no, they have no charge. They don't uh, interact in any other way. And the weak force, as its name would imply, is, is kind of weak. Um, and neutrinos in particular are, are very, very ghostly in this sense. So uh, the, some of my favorite things uh, that I've heard and, uh, and seen calculations of, so that it takes a neutrino, a single neutrino would uh, travel through about a light year of lead before it would typically interact. Uh, and uh, and even, even more fun, I saw this calculation and, and I just love it. So there's about 2 billion trillion neutrinos that will end up passing through you in your lifetime. But uh, only one in four of us will, will likely have a single one interact in our bodies. And that's how rare the, these neutrinos uh, are, uh, are typically to, inter to interact with matter. And that's why uh, we often kind of call them ghost particles, uh, because while they're not really ghosts and they're not truly invisible because they do interact, uh, they, they do so so rarely and go through, so, uh, go through matter so often that they kind of uh, act and feel like ghosts in that sense. OK, so that's all fine and good. And there's this nifty new particle. But why do we, why do we really care about neutrinos? What makes them so special? Why, why would we be interested in studying them? Um, I, one, of the, one of the things that makes them so interesting is, is how mysterious they are. Um, and we don't really know that much about them because they're so hard to detect. But a lot of what we know is actually really kind of strange. Um, and that and that opens up a lot of uh, other mysteries and, and makes us makes us believe that they might uh, be able to tell us more about the universe uh, uh, around us. So uh, let's uh, let's talk about some of that. So for a long time, we thought neutrinos and antineutrinos, you know, they came in the three flavors that I talked about before: uh, an electron neutrino, a muon neutrino, and a tau neutrino, um, and that they had uh, no mass. We didn't. Uh, it seemed like that they had no mass. Um, the the in, with based on their interactions in matter, um, and uh, and based on the theories we have, that made sense. And so, uh, so we thought you know uh, the neutrinos had no mass. Um, and so uh, when we act, when we detect a neutrino, how do and and talk about the flavor of a neutrino? Uh, it's the flavor of the neutrino. Uh, is really kind of tied to the, its partner uh, lepton, so either the electron, muon, or tau. So let's say we have a neutron here, and we have 
an electron neutrino come in. So this is kind of the reverse interaction from the uh, nuclear decay, the beta decay that we talked about before. That neutrino will interact with the neutron and can turn it into uh, interact with uh, can turn it into a proton, and it will produce an electron as well. Uh, so if it's an electron neutrino. Now similarly, if we have a muon neutrino, it can come in in the same same kind of way, it interact with a neutron, uh, turn it into a proton. Except the muon neutrino will uh, create a muon instead. Um, and that's just because of the flavor of the neutrino. So the electron neutrinos uh, will interact with, you know, with a neutron and create a proton and electron. Muon neutrinos will, will interact with a neutron and create a proton and muon. And that's, you know, that's the, the flavors don't mix. That's just how they are. Um, but uh, when uh, we tried to detect electrons that neutri electron neutrinos that came from the sun, we seem to be missing about half of them. All of the, all of the measurements that we made uh, seem to indicate that there were far fewer electron neutrinos coming from the sun than we, than we thought there were, there, that there should be. Uh, and then also when we tried to detect muon neutrinos coming from interactions in our atmosphere, it seemed like we were missing a lot of those too. Um, but when we uh, upgraded our detectors and found ways to be able to be sensitive to any flavor of neutrino, it seemed like all of the neutrinos were there. So we got back our half that were missing from the sun, we got back our missing neutrinos from the atmosphere. And so uh, as it turns out, neutrinos can change flavor as they travel. So how does this work? So if you, uh, if you start with say a muon neutrino and produce a muon neutrino, uh, which will, uh, we'll look at this blue color here. Um, after uh, it travels some distance, uh, it's less likely to be detected as a muon neutrino. And so the probability that we'll detect a, a muon neutrino uh, that was created at some point as a muon neutrino uh, some, some distance away uh, will decrease. And instead, it can be more likely to be detected as a, say, a tau neutrino. Uh, in, instead. And if you go a little bit further away, then uh, you allow the, the neutrino to travel more, the probability can change again. It can, it can increase the chance back that it will be detected as a muon neutrino again. And so this sort of oscillating behavior and the probability of when you start with a muon of one type and one flavor, what's the likelihood that you'll uh, detect it as a different type uh, if you're some distance away from it, uh, is, is what we call neutrino oscillation. And this neutrino oscillation pattern depends on the energy of the neutrino. Uh, and importantly, according to our theories, it requires that the neutrinos have mass. Um, and in a kind of a strange way that their mass and their flavor don't perfectly line up. And so the oscill oscillatory behavior is dependent on these differences in the in the mass states of the neutrinos, um, uh, as well as the how far they travel, um, the energy that they have, and some uh, mixing parameter, some mixing angle of how how much of different types of uh, uh, neutrino flavors uh, belong to each of the different mass states. So, why is this neutrino oscillation important? Uh, so our theories suggest that if we can measure the likelihood of the neutrinos to change flavor so that we can kind of map out that probability space uh, of how neutrinos, uh, neutrino flavor changes as they travel, that we can uh, better understand the nature of neutrino masses because the oscillation, the patterns of that oscillation are tied directly to, uh, to uh, the different neutrino masses can discover whether there are new kinds of neutrinos. Uh, because if there was a, a new kind of particle, a new kind of neutrino that neutrinos could uh, oscillate, in, uh, oscillate into, then, uh, then the, that pattern would, would re reflect itself on the, those oscillation probabilities. And importantly, we can look and use this oscillation behavior to see if neutrinos and antineutrinos behave in the same way. Um, 
And that's a very important uh, puzzle remaining in physics is to uh, get to a much deeper level of why we see more matter than antimatter in our universe. And we think that you know, neutrinos and antineutrinos behaving in a different way could, uh, could help us, uh, could potentially hold some of the secrets to where this matter and antimatter asymmetry in the universe is coming from. And so this is one of the reasons, one of the key reasons that we really want to study this neutrino oscillation phenomenon. Okay, so that's a bit about why, what neutrinos are and why, uh, why we're interested in detecting them and why uh, we're especially interested in this uh, very strange neutrino oscillation. But how do we actually detect neutrinos? Uh, so the neutrino detection plan, you know, involves, uh, you know, a few different things. And the, 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 the blueprint is something like this. So first, uh, you know, we need a source of neutrinos and we need, we need that source to be very intense. Neutrinos don't interact very much. So if we're going to be able to detect them, we're going to have to produce a lot of them and, uh, and make sure that our uh, detector is going to see lots of neutrinos because the more, ne the, the more neutrinos it sees, then the, the greater the likelihood that one of them will happen to interact in our detector. So we just need a lot of neutrinos. Two, we want as big of a detector as we can, because the more m matter that we uh, put in front of those neutrinos to interact with, the more likely the more likely that we'll be to get an interaction as well. And so we want really big detectors, um, and and that's a that's a key for neutrino detectors uh, uh, on the whole and moving forward um, is to make as big of a detector as we can. Um, okay, so we have a source of neutrinos, we have a big detector, the neutrinos interact in the detector, you know, and, you know, magic happens and boom, we have our interactions and then we analyze them and we learn about the universe as a whole. So we'll get back to that middle part in a bit. So, but let's, let's start with step one here. So step one, the neutrinos themselves. So uh, there's a lot of different places that we can look for neutrinos. Uh, and there's a lot of neutrinos, like I mentioned before, that come from nature the, itself. But one of the cool things is, is that we can actually use particle accelerators to produce neutrinos too. And uh, one of the nice things that particle accelerators allows us, uh, allow us to do is that we can produce particle accelerators at sort of the optimal energy and put our detectors in the optimal location in order to uh, probe and detect neutrino oscillations to sort of maximize our ability to see these neutrino flavor, cha uh, flavor changes. So how how does a neutrino uh, how does a neutrino beam and neutrino detector work for detecting oscillations? So when we make a neutrino beam, it, we usually start with them mostly as one one flavor of neutrinos. We try to make our neutrino sources as pure in one flavor as possible, and usually that's making our neutrinos uh, a neutrino beam with uh, muon neutrinos or muon anti neutrinos, and try to have as pure of a source of muon neutrinos. Um, as we can. And then in our detectors, we uh, study the final interaction products to understand what kind of neutrino uh, we've detected and, and what the flavor of that neutrino was and how much energy it had. So if you start with something like on the left with a neutrino source, and typically how these beams work is that we create a bunch of uh, uh, energetic uh, uh, particles that when they decay, uh, they uh, decay into neutrinos as part of those decay processes. And so here, for instance, we have a, uh, what's called a charged pion that will decay into an anti-muon, but a, an, a muon neutrino. And that's a, that's a common way for us to get a set of uh, muon neutrinos as part of a beam. So that's, that's, our, that's where our neutrino, uh, neutrinos are created in our neutrino beam. And then they'll travel some time over to a neutrino detector, which has a lot, of, uh, a lot of matter, a lot of mass in it. Included in that are a lot of, say, neutrons uh, within those atomic nuclei. And uh, by the time the neutrino gets to the neutrino detector, we don't know what flavor it is, but we look at what happens in the interaction and we see, uh, we see what we see. So if the, it, we should see, say, a neutron 
uh, you know, turn into a proton. And then if we see a muon resulting from that interaction, then we know that that was a muon neutrino that interacted in our detector. And so we started with a muon neutrino. We, we saw a muon neutrino appear in our detector. And so there was no flavor change for that interaction. If instead of a muon, we were to see an electron, then that would have to be an electron neutrino because, because that's how the neutrino interactions work with respect to flavor. And that would mean then, since we started with a sort of a pure set of muon neutrinos, that would mean that the muon neutrinos, a muon neutrino had to change flavor as it traveled. Okay, so uh, that's, that's how we can get neutrinos um, using neutrino beams. That's what Fermilab is good at doing and getting, uh, getting better, as you saw from the intro video on PIP2. Uh, let's now talk about the next, the next part, the detectors. So there's a lot of different kinds of particle detectors and, and different things that we can use for neutrino detectors. But my favorite, and it's because it's what I work on, but it is my favorite still, are liquid argon time projection chambers. Or, or what are called liquid R, R TPCs in this acronym that you'll see me use throughout some of this talk. So how do those work? Uh, first, we get a really large uh, cryostat and we fill it with many, many tons of liquid argon. So argon, you'll remember, hopefully, is, a, is an atomic element. It's actually the third most abundant uh, uh, element in, uh, in air. Um, and so basically, you know, we can liquefy uh, that argon from the air, uh, it's very cold, um, and put it into this cryostat and use it as a, detect, uh, a, a target for our neutrinos to hit. Then uh, what we do within that really large cryostat that's filled with this liquid argon is on one side of it, we put a really high voltage and this create and, and we, we do it so that it creates a really negatively charged cathode. And then on the other side of the detector, we put a bunch of really finely spaced wires and that we're going to use to try to collect our, our signals, which I'll talk about how we do that in a second. And they have a slight positive charge. So if you have uh, a negative charge that appears inside of this detector, then it's gonna wanna move away from the cathode and over front on the left and over to the right towards the wires um, uh, because uh, uh, negative charges wanna move away from negative charges and towards positive charges. Okay, so what does that actually look like in, in pictures? So this is an example uh, with the microboon uh, liquid argon TPC. So microboon is one of the experiments that I work on um, and, uh, and it uh, has been operating at Fermilab uh, for over five years now. Um, so uh, the detector you can see on the, on the right-hand side with some people that, you know, uh, posing very uh, uh, heroically inside of the detector as they were finishing the installation of it. It's actually, it's about the size of a school bus is kind of, is, is kind of the dimensions to think about. Um, and it has, on one side, you can see in, the, in, that, in that picture on the, on the right, you can see this giant steel plate on the left, that's the cathode. That's the thing that we're gonna put at really high voltage. And then on the right, you can't see in that picture very well, but you can see better in the picture on the lower left here, all of the individual wires. Um, and so these are, these are wires that are spaced uh, really, really close together, just three millimeters apart. And in total, there's over 8,000 inside of the, uh, the microboon liquid argon TPC. And in fact, they're arranged in three different directions, which you can, on the lower left-hand picture, you can kind of see the light gleaming off of them. They're all plated in gold to, to increase their conductivity, which gives them this really nice uh, gentle sheen. Um, but the, uh, you can see the different angles at which the, uh, at which the wires are arranged. And I'll talk about why that's important uh, in a second. Um, okay, but uh, Dave mentioned the physics slam that I made a claymation video of. Um, so I'm gonna show you a little bit from that because I'm still super proud of it. Um, and, uh, and it shows, uh, shows kind of how the detector works. So 
So in this in this video, so we're gonna we're gonna kind of recreate what happens when we have a neutrino interaction happen in our detector. So uh, the neutrino, which you're not going to see because it's you know a ghost, uh, it's basically invisible. Uh, the neutrino is going to interact with one of our argon atoms inside of the detector. And like uh, like I said before, if it's like a muon neutrino, it can create uh, a muon and a proton as part of that reaction. And then those muons and protons, what happens is that they have a lot of energy from, from the interaction. And so they fly out inside the detector. And as they travel through the rest of the argon that's in liquid argon that's inside of the detector, they ionize a lot of those argon atoms and they create a lot of these little red guys, these ionization electrons. And these ionization electrons, they're electrons, so they have negative charge and they've just been released from their atoms. And they're you know, sitting in this really large electric field where there's this really, really, uh, uh, there's this really negatively charged cathode on one side, and then there's these nice positively charged wires on the other. And so they're going to move away from the cathode and towards our collection wires. And so then it's the, these little ionization electrons that we actually uh, detect on those wires. So, uh, so a little video of that. So. Uh, here we have our neutrino interaction happen sometime we're in the detector and this muon and proton then start to travel through and create all these ionization electrons. Now the proton doesn't typically travel as far in the detector. It creates a lot more ionization electrons but then tends to stop. Uh, whereas the muon will typically travel a lot farther but create fewer electrons. Then after those have uh, moved through the argon, on a much slower time scale, you see the elect ionization electrons start to drift. And in this video, it's the, they drift down, so the cathode must, you know, is, is sort of on the top, and the, the wires that we're going to detect them on are uh, below. Okay, so that's, that's kind of the key of how, you know, how these interactions work. So, uh, how does this mean that we actually get to see ghosts? I, uh, like I said before, we don't uh, we don't actually see the the neutrino itself. What we see are the particles that are produced by its interaction with the argon. We see the the traces that those inter uh, that those particles leave in our detector. Those those inter those particles that are a result of the neutrino interaction. And like I mentioned while, uh, while we were going through the video, different particles leave different kinds of traces in our detectors. So muons leave long tracks with fewer ionization electrons. Protons leave short tracks with lots of ionization electrons. Um, and electrons and photons create are, are what are called showers of ionization in our detector. And in the end, what we get is these really high resolution pictures of neutrino interactions. So something like this. So this is an actual neutrino interaction uh, from microboon. Um, and so what we're looking at here is a neutrino interaction point so right over there on the left and a, a few you know, shorter tracks that seem to leave a bit more ionization. They have a bit more green hue to them, which means that they left more charge. And so those are, look like uh, protons. And then this really long track that's coming down and to the right. Uh, which is leaving less charge as it goes and it's really long. And so that really looks like uh, what we would expect to see from a muon. And now for those electromagnetic showers, here's a neutrino interaction that looks like it's, it has one of those uh, uh, electron showers in it. And so here you see a bunch of uh, you know, shorter, highly ionizing tracks on the left coming out from the interaction point. And then this really nicely developing uh, electron track that turns into sort of a shower of particles that leave, you know, more and more ionization as they travel through, uh, as it travels through the detector. And that's, so that, those are, those are sort of the basic images of what we're looking for uh, when, in, in these detectors. And th these are the, these are the images that we analyze in order to reconstruct the neutrino interaction and all the different particles that were created. So, how we do that is those ionization electrons, they have a really nice property. As they travel to the detection wires, they basically travel at a constant speed. And so we can count how long it takes them to arrive uh, on our detection wires and determine where in the detector they occurred. And we know when to start counting because there's something I didn't say before, but when those neutrinos interact and create those charged particles, uh, 
they also leave a flash of light in the detector and we can record that light and we record that light pretty instantaneously. And so we, we kind of have a start time of when the interaction happened. And then we can wait for those electron neutrinos, or sorry, not those, those ionization electrons to arrive. And, and then when they do, we stop the clock and we calculate, okay, if it took you this long to arrive, then you were traveling at this speed, you must have occurred at this point in the detector. Now, I mentioned earlier too that microbeam has these three planes of detection wires uh, at different angles, and that's true of most liquid argon TPCs. And what that does is it gives us sort of a different perspective, uh, on a different angle to look at the interactions on. And so what we do then is we can combine those perspectives and that signal arrival time to basically give us a three-dimensional view of the interaction. And then we can reconstruct the full neutrino interaction and all the properties of the neutrinos themselves. Okay, so what about that third question, question, question step? I'm glad you asked. Um, remember our neutrino detection plant. So we need a source of neutrinos. We need big detectors. Okay, we got a beam. We have all this liquid argon that's there. You know, once, you know, and then something, you know, we need to somehow turn that into something that we can analyze. And then, okay, once we have all those pretty pictures though, we can analyze the interactions and we can study everything we want about neutrinos and learn about the universe. So how do we actually turn what we see in our detector into data that we can analyze? That's what we're gonna talk about for the, for the most of the rest of this talk. Uh, we're still okay on time, I hope. Um, so th that process is called uh, data acquisition. So we use a combination of specialized electronics, uh, configurable electronics and computer software uh, to do a number of things, but the, the, it basically comes down to being able to digitize all of our detector signals so that we can, uh, so that we can store them on, you know, on computers and be able to analyze them later. And then combine all of those signals from the different parts of the detector together to create the full event. So that combine all of the information from all the different wires, from all the different perspectives in order to get this full image of the neutrino interaction. So let's walk through a little bit of how that's done for our TPC signals and some of the, some of the pieces there. Um, so here's an example of what a signal on a wire in a very simple way, uh, what a signal on a wire looks like. So as those, uh, as, as those electrons come to, uh, come to the wires, um, they'll leave a, they'll induce a current um, that we can turn into a voltage. Um, that'll, and so that, that'll leave sort of a positive voltage as they're approaching the wire. And then as then they can move, move past that wire, they'll induce a current in the opposite direction um, and uh, give us a, a, a a voltage drop, and so in and uh, in our readout electronics, and then we get a signal that looks something like this, uh, and so this is kind of the basic signal of what uh, of what uh, these electron these ionization electrons look at as as they go by these wires. Um, then we use what's called an analog to digital converter or EDC uh, to digitize this signal, and so uh, so this is a nice, clean, analog, theoretical looking signal of what things should look like. But then we sample it and turn it into something that uh, uh, raw numbers that we can use in a computer. And you know, it's going to look something like this, a little bit blockier, but it's something that then we can uh, store in our computers and do data analysis on. OK, so how do those uh, analog to digital uh, converters work? Um, I think this is really cool. So, so please bear with me while we kind of walk through it. What we want to do is we want to take an analog potential value and approximate it with a number uh, and, and turn, it, turn that, you know, that real signal, that sort of you know, real voltage that we're measuring into a number that we can store in a computer. Uh, so uh, there's these things called comparators, uh, little electronic circuits that can tell us whether our signal is above or below some sort of, you know, certain voltage threshold. So uh, say, you know, that threshold could be, for instance, as an example, two volts. And so if we have a signal come in, uh, this little converter basically asks, uh, is the signal greater than uh, two volts? Um, and if it is, it gives us, you know, it can give us an output that, you know, says, yes, uh, we see uh, a, a signal out. 
And if it's no, then uh, it, it, there's nothing that comes out. And so then we know that, you know, that that's a no. Um, we can kind of turn those yeses and nos into ones and zeros, like, like sort of uh, basic logic. Now, that's just using one comparator. Uh, how we can actually, uh, you know, and that just, you know, is based on one threshold. And so how we can actually build this up is by adding multiple comparators and multiple sort of logic circuits to be able to get a more precise measurement. And so, uh, for instance, so if we wanted to do something that would uh, give us a bit more precision, we would, could have something like this, where we have comparators that look for, you know, that ask is a, the signal input greater than two volts? Is it greater than three volts? Is it greater than one volt? And uh, all of these, we can sort of get little yeses and nos. We can also combine those yeses and nos um, in different logical ways. Um, so uh, for instance, on the, the lower middle part here, there's a little logic circuit that we want to, that we can implement that basically asks, okay, was the voltage signal input less than two volts? So it was a no on this comparator on the top here, uh, but also greater than one volt. So on the comparator on the bottom, it was a yes. And if that's true, okay, great. Uh, then we can do like a little logical or over on the bottom right hand side and said, okay, is that thing on the left true or was the signal greater than three volts true? And if yes, that can give us a, you know, and an yes. And if no, then we have a no there. Okay, so you might be wondering, okay, this looks really complicated and I don't really see what this actually does for us. Let's look at a few examples. So uh, let's say our input voltage is 2.5 volts and we can sort of walk through uh, what the output from all of these different uh, logics and, and com uh, comparators is. So is the signal greater than two volts? Yeah, it is. And so that's something that we can, uh, that, that we can store and keep. Uh, then we can ask, is it greater than three volts? No, it's not. Um, and so, that, so that's a no. And on the very bottom path, we can ask, is it greater than one volt? It is, that's true. Um, but is it uh, also less than two volts? And no, it's not. And so then on the very bottom, both of the inputs into that final or are no's. And so we have a no that comes out. And in the end, we can take that, uh, the output from the very bottom, and we can use that as our least significant digit in our result, and the output from the very top and use that as the most significant digit in our result and use that to get sort of a, a digitized result. Um, and so that's a, a one and a zero in binary. And if you remember how to count in binary numbers, a one and zero uh, is two. And so the, the result here from digitizing this signal would take a signal of 2.5, input signal of 2.5 volts and would give us an output of two volts, but now in a digital form that we can use and store you know, in a computer. Uh, okay, so how does that work for a different value? We can kind of run through this same thing again, say with 3.5 volts. Um, so the top path is, a, is again, it's a yes. And if we go on the middle path is the signal greater than three volts, that's a yes. And we don't even have to worry about the very bottom part because we already know um, are either of the two bottom paths yes? Well, the, the middle one is. And so that's a yes on the output there. And so the digitized result is one one in binary. And that, that one one in binary is three. And so we turn that 3.5 volt analog uh, input into a three volt digital output. So there's some rounding and some loss of precision um, when, we do, when we do this procedure. Uh, but uh, it's, it's doing the job of taking uh, uh, sort of a, any kind of voltage input that we have and giving us a digital uh, voltage out. So la one last example, uh, just, to, uh, do, just to see the, the full spectrum of sorts real quickly. So here's the 1.5 volts. Um, and so on the very top path, it's not greater than two volts. And so that most significant digit is zero. But on the very bottom path, it is greater than one volt and less than two volts. And so that very uh, least significant digit ends up being a yes. And so then the digitized result is going to end up being one volt. And so that's how a really in uh, basic, simple ADC can work. Um, 
So the more comparators we use, so the more precision that we can get. And so that's something that goes into uh, the, the precision of our ADCs. And all of these circuits perform this operation at a set frequency or a sampling rate. And so in the end result, we get a sequence of numbers uh, representing our signal. So we have that original analog blue, uh, nice smooth input signal, and then we turn it into this blocky but now digitized red signal. And so that you know might look something like this if we actually print out all of the numbers, and where you know there's a portion that where there's no signal that's at some you know baseline uh, you know uh, value, and then there's a part that goes up where the number where the numbers go high, and then there's a part where the voltage goes down and the numbers go down too. Okay, so I okay you can probably tell I think this stuff is really cool. This is this this kind of you know using building blocks and things like this of you know uh, electronics or software or other things and and you know kind of mixing and matching all the tools you know in order to solve a problem in a you know creative way of how you know in this case how do you take something uh, you know some voltage that you can measure and actually turn it you know uh, run it through some basic uh, logic to to be able to you know, get an approximation of that, but that you can digitize and you can store in a computer and that you can do analysis with later. Uh, I, this is, I, this is really fun. And so I think this is, you know, one of the, one of the things about data acquisition that I find so, so intriguing. It's like, it's, it's a, often I feel like a set of fun puzzles and problem solving and you just, you know, try to understand how things can work and come up with clever and creative solutions. Okay, so uh, let's move on though. So I'm um, come up to maybe a few more small little clever things. Um, so how much data uh, will, will this end up creating? So we can do a quick calculation. Uh, so microboon has around 8,256 wires and the sampling frequencies of its ADCs are about two megahertz or is two megahertz. So that's, you know, one sample every 500 nanoseconds. And each of the ADCs, I showed you a, a silly little example that was a two-bit precision ADC. The ADCs we use in Microboon are 12-bit precision. And so what that ends up being, it's, it's almost 25 gigabytes of data coming from the detector every second. And that's over two petabytes per day. That's a lot of data. Um, I was trying to look up some comparisons for, for how much you know, data that is into something that you know, is somewhat comparable. And I think one of the ones I found is that uh, there, I saw an estimate that all of Facebook per day um, produces four petabytes from everybody in the world, um, which, uh, so, you know, one microboon produces sort of uh, half of Facebook's worth of data per day, which is just astounding to me because, you know, this is, a, it's a big detector, yeah, but it's, you know, the size of a school bus. Uh, it's just these 8,000 wires. Uh, the future deep underground neutrino experiment that I'll say a tiny bit about later is going to be about 200 times that. So it, it, this is a lot of data. And it's really important that we reduce that amount of data. That is far too much for us to be able to collect and record and analyze. And so we need to have, uh, try to find ways to handle and reduce and reduce that data. So one of the things that we do that I think is really cool is we do real-time data compression in, in, in Microboon. And so we just uh, need to, uh, you know, in order to do some data compression, you have to come up with some nifty algorithm for how, how you're going to do that. And so let me kind of walk through that with you real quickly, because again, I think this is just so super cool. So let's look at that pulse again. And so here's our nicely, uh, nicely defined digitized pulse. Um, we've lost a little bit of precision because we don't have infinite precision with our ADCs, but this is still pretty good. Um, and you can see, say, say, you know, each of those, the values from the numbers there on the top. So one of the things that's true about uh, liquid argon TPCs is that the, away from the signals, the, the potential and the data values, they don't change very much. And so we can actually use that by rather than storing one, uh, one value, a one, uh, one full value for every sample, so that would be 12 bits for every sample, we can instead try to encode the difference between successive samples into, uh, in, 
into the into the data stream and try to use that to come up with a way to reduce the overall data volume. So how how can that work? Um, so we can do something something like this. So let's let's look at our uh, our series of numbers there that represent our waveform. This is just the same. These are just all the numbers uh, here inside each of the uh, each of the blocks of the waveform that are presented there. And so so and so let's start with the very first sample that we have is 2048. So let's record that. You know that's uh, 12 bits in binary. It's a one zero 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 zero. And now let's look at the next sample right next to that one. It's also 2048. And so what we can do is we can compare the next sample to the previous one. And if it's the same, rather than store the whole value in the 12-bit binary, like, uh, like I showed right there above, we instead can just say, OK, we're just going to encode this as a 1 in binary. And so we can use one bit to, to store it instead of 12. And what that one means, it doesn't mean that, OK, this is exactly one in potential. What, what we're doing is we're creating a code. And we're saying, OK, when you see one in the code here, that means that it's the same as the previous sample. Now, if it's maybe it's greater, maybe the, the sample is greater than one than the previous sample. And so instead of, uh, we can create a code for that too and, and use, and use a binary one zero. Uh, so use two bits to encode a difference of, great, of plus one. And we can use three bits, so one zero zero to encode a difference of minus one. And so this is called a sort of a Huffman coding uh, scheme, and we can we can kind of do this for all the different uh, differences and different values as we move along. Um, but tip, but when we get to more than three values away, it starts to not be very efficient to store all of these differences, and so we just store the the that numbered sample again. So how does this work in our in our value here? So if you look at that top sequence again, there's 16 values I presented there. So that's 192 total bits to store. And so with our compression algorithm, uh, the first value, it's still, you know, we still need to store the starting point. So that's still going to be 12 bits. But the second value, it's 2048 as well. It's the same as the first one. And so we can store it as that binary one and only use one bit to store it. The next value is 2049. That's just one greater than the one before it. And so According to the scheme that we had on the last slide, we can use two bits to store that one. So that's going to be a one zero. And then if we look at the next value again, that's 2051. We're really only slowly going up. Um, and so for that one, we can code that as a one zero zero zero. So use four bits and, uh, and keep going from there. Now, the next one uh, is 2059, if you look up at the top again. And that's, that's quite a bit different than that original 2000, the one before it, 2051. And so we're going to need to actually use the full 12 bits to, to store that full value again. And you can kind of keep walking through the, the whole sequence like this as we go along and see how many bits you're going to need to store each of these values uh, as you move along. And it turns out for, the, for that silly little sample waveform that I had, uh, rather than uh, 192 bits to store it if you don't do any kind of compression, that one you can get away with only using 127 bits instead. And so that's about, you know, that's about 30, you know, 30% off or 33% off. It's a, it's a, it's a good bargain. Uh, I'd go shopping for that. Um, now that's even underselling things a little bit because in, in our detectors that, that are most of the regions in our detectors don't have signals. Um, that they're mostly empty and, and just have some uh, really small deviations due to noise. And so rather than getting uh, only sort of a two thirds improvement on our data volume, what we typically get is actually a compression factor of four to five. And also the simplicity of this algorithm means that it can run inside programmable digital electronics called FPGAs. And so these are uh, these are circuits, uh, but they're kind of programmable circuits, and they can run. Uh, they can run fast, and they need less power than a computer does. So they they typically have less resources available to them, but uh, they can be uh, they can be programmed to handle data on the fly and in, in sort of a data pipeline as it comes through, and that's really beneficial for doing this kind of real time uh, compression 
And so as we're taking the data, we can basically compress it uh, as it's coming off of the detector. And we don't have to collect all of it and then run some other kind of algorithm on it. So just as an example to, to show, so it, it, back to what one of these events looks like. So around our signals, we'll get some level of compression, but because things are changing a bit more there, it's, it's kind of like the example that we had before. But in these other regions of the, of the detector where there's not particles going through, and it's just kind of the base, the, you know, the, the noise, um, and uh, we can get lots of compression. And so that's where we can get really this factor of four to five on the, on the whole. So uh, I need to move more quickly. Uh, so uh, can we read out all the data then? No, and actually we wouldn't really want to. So, so still, even with that level of compression, it's still too much data to read out. But <laughs> most of the data is not that interesting. The neutrino beam for microbeam sends neutrinos uh, to us at about five times a second. And then even then, only around one in 600 times does a neutrino interact in our detector. And then uh, even if there's a neutrino interaction, it, it's not all of the data that we need to collect. It's only around two milliseconds for the amount of the time that it takes for electrons to drift from one side of the detector to the other. So trying to collect and analyze all of the data, you know, if we were keeping everything would take way too much time. So we need smart ways to find the data that we really care about. So this is what we call the trigger. And so the, the, uh, the point of the trigger is to kind of intelligently tell our detector when to record data. And so we wanna quickly combine information from the detector and other sources to make a decision as to when and how much data to record. So how do we do that for our liquid argon TPCs? So a simple flow chart of how a trigger system and a DAQ work together is something like this. <coughs> Excuse me. So we have our detector data coming in on the, on the bottom left into our detector readout electronics. And we take some subset of that data, we send it to our trigger system, uh, which can also collect uh, external data inputs. And using all of that data together, it makes a decision, oh, I think there might be a neutrino in this event. And it sends that signal back to our detector electronics, which then uh, ship all of the data around that time to the rest of our data acquisition system. So for, for us, what are the ingredients for this? The number one ingredient is the beam. So, <coughs> excuse me, for neutrinos uh, from the beam, we know that they have to happen in time with the beam because uh, we're getting a beam of neutrinos one, uh, five times a second from, from Fermilab. So what we can use is use a signal from the Fermilab accelerator to form part of our trigger decision. You know, doing careful calibration of all the signal delays and neutrino traveling time and etc. So if we go back to our flow chart, that little uh, orange box of external data is that beam timing information. So how is how do we uh, how what other information can we use? Um, even knowing, like I said before, even knowing that we have neutrino beam uh, neutrinos from the beam into our detector, uh, a lot of times there's still no neutrino interaction. And so in order to find a way to reduce the data rate, uh, we need to look into the detector and see what we see. Um, and now the first thing you could ask is, can we use information from the TPC? And that's actually really challenging. So this is kind of a typical event uh, here. It's a very pretty one, but it's sort of a typical one. We have a nice neutrino interaction, but there's a lot of other interactions in the detector. These are all cosmic ray muons. Um, and these, TPCs are rather slow detector. And in the time that it takes for us to get the signals from a neutrino interaction, there's a lot of cosmic ray particles that can enter and interact in our detector too. They sort of photobomb our, our, our neutrino signal. And so if we wanna use the information from the TPC, uh, it's, it's really hard to do that in real time. In, in analysis algorithms that we run later, we can remove these cosmic rays but it takes a lot of processing time and that it takes too long to be included in our tr trigger, which has to make a quick decision about what kind of data to uh, collect and use. So uh, you, might you might remember that I mentioned before that in addition to the ionization electrons that we detect light from the interactions that happen. And this light is actually something that we can detect very quickly. 
uh, that's how we know the start time of, of when uh, the ionization electrons start moving in the detector. And so we can combine this information with our beam gate in order to form, uh, to form our trigger. And so what we do is we take the data from the light detectors and we ask, do we see a bunch of data in our light, uh, see a bunch of signals in our light detectors at the same time, so in coincidence with the beam? And if so, maybe there was a neutrino. And that, that then forms our trigger. That's our really basic, simple trigger for neutrino, for liquid argon TPC neutrino detector. So does that mean that we only record neutrinos then? It's still not the case. So it turns out because neutrinos still happen so rarely that most of the data we record are still due to cosmic rays. And it's cosmic rays that just so happen to go through our detector at the same time as the beam. Um, in the neutrinos were going through the detector, but you know, more often than not, they still don't interact. But maybe there was a random cosmic that came through and interacted in the detector at the same time. And so, so there's still a lot of work for us to do to sort out all of those, uh, all of those interactions. But requiring this coincidence of light and beam still reduces the trigger rate, um, and it does it to much less than once a second. And so that's something that we can handle much more easily in our in our later analysis. So putting it all together from there, we have our we have our data. It's been triggered, and now we collect all of our data from all of our different subsystems. Um, and we combine all of the TPC signals together, all of the light detectors together, you know, ex cosmic ray detectors that we have outside of the cryostat together, um, and uh, do what we call event building, which is making sure that we have the data from the whole detector, making sure that it's all synchronized and collated properly so that we have all of the pieces of data that belong to one event that could belong to the same neutrino interaction. And then we store those uh, we store those uh, that data to to uh, disks so that we can then go and analyze them later. And we also make sure that we have available some stream of data so that we can do some live monitoring of the data to make sure that all the data looks okay while we're taking it. And that's that's the uh, job of sort of the downstream data acquisition process. So looking towards the future, uh, the. I, uh, the long baseline neutrino facility is going to create a really intense neutrino beam here at Fermilab, as you saw in the, the opening video. And that new, those neutrinos are going to travel um, all the way to South Dakota, where we're going to have uh, the deep underground neutrino experiment. So with four big neutrino detectors in South Dakota, and there will even be a, a detector here too to, to measure the neutrinos before they travel or before, they, you know, before they've had the chance to oscillate. Um, it's important to be deep underground because uh, because uh, you saw from before the impact that cosmic rays can have on our data. Um, and one of the things that we want to do in Dune is to be able to see neutrinos from other sources that aren't just the beam. So for instance, if a supernova goes off in our galaxy, we'd expect to see hundreds of neutrino interactions in Dune. And that would tell us a lot about astrophysics and about neutrinos. So by putting the detector deep underground, we can shield it from that steady stream of cosmic ray particles. But it's triggering for supernova neutrinos, if you think about it, is, is actually going to be rather difficult. So one, the neutrino, supernova neutrinos actually are much lower in energy, and so they leave much smaller sig signatures in the detector. But even more importantly, you remember from before, one of our key points of triggering for microboon was you know, using the beam, that we had a neutrino beam, and we know when the beam hit. We don't know when a supernova might go off, uh, so the, we can't use a we can't use some kind of supernova signal that that tells us that neutrinos uh, neutrinos from a supernova are going to be coming. Uh, we have to be looking at the data uh, ourselves and see if we think that we see a neutrino. And so that's this is what Dune is really working hard on right now is to develop triggers that will use the TPC data to be able to catch a burst of neutrinos from a from a galaxy you know, that's uh, from a supernova that goes off in our galaxy or even from a galaxy farther away. And an example of what that would look like is over here on the right. So this is, uh, this is a neutrino interaction that happened in a different liquid argon TPC, the Arganut detector. And so that, the neutrino interaction there is rather energetic, but if you look closely, uh, there's some little blips that are a, a little farther away from the neutrino interaction, and those are low energy deposits from 
uh, either photons or neutrons that come off of the interaction. And those are the kinds of blips that supernova neutrinos uh, will leave in our, uh, in our detector in Dune and sort of a, of a similar energy. And so that's the kind of activity that we're going to need to learn how to trigger on and pick up in our detector, in the, in the future Dune detectors. Okay, so real quickly, uh, just a few more slides. Um, so uh, I wanna say, so th there's of course uh, data acquisition systems and other particle detectors. I absolutely love neutrinos, but the trigger in DAQ and other detectors can even be more challenging. Um, I like to talk about it in the, with respect to neutrinos because it's a bit simpler, but uh, say the particle detectors at the LHC, like, you, uh, like as an example, the CMS detector here on the right, this cartoon showing how uh, particles can interact, uh, interact in that the different pieces of that detector. The LHC sees protons interact and collide with each other every 25 nanoseconds. And so their trigger and DAQ systems need to be able to, to handle and uh, decide which data to keep from all of those proton interactions, and, uh, proton collisions, and scale down the recorded events by factors of about 100,000. And so this requires a much larger variety and different levels of triggers and data acquisition than, than sort of the simpler case that I showed you for microboom. In general, the future challenges for detectors like Dune and uh, future collider detectors as well is, is going to be able to handle more and more data. So we're actually anticipating that future detectors are going to need to handle raw data rates that would reach sort of the exabyte per second. So that's uh, uh, many orders of magnitude even beyond uh, what, what, I, what I mentioned before from uh, Microboon and even Dune. And alongside of that, there will require synchronizing readout electronics and measuring particles with picosecond precision. Um, so uh, to be able to uh, get, the, get the absolute most out of uh, particle identification techniques. Uh, particle physics in general is, is really driving forward technologies in, in this high speed detector readout. And in, in we often are working with really extreme environments. So like cryogenic temperatures, like we do in liquid argon TPCs, but also in high magnetic fields and under high radiation, like you would inside of a particle collider, like the uh, detector, like uh, at CMS or Atlas at the LHC. And another thing that is really cool about uh, particle physics triggers and data acquisition, is that we're really driving forward applications in ultra fast machine learning. And so you've maybe heard about machine learning algorithms and, and uh, and ways to, uh, to train, train computers to, to pick out, uh, uh, do a bunch of different tasks in artificial intelligence. And this is something that we're looking to do as well, except we have the extra challenge in triggers in DAQ to try to do these at sort of the really, really fast times. So to, do the, to make decisions in milliseconds or microseconds um, and to enable this uh, more efficient data handling for the future. So uh, to summarize, how, how do we record a ghost? So we need to uh, source a lot of, we need to source with a lot of neutrinos. We need a big detectors with a lot of mass um, for them to interact in. And we need a trigger and data acquisition system that's smart enough to catch all of those interactions. And then we get to analyze those interactions and learn about the universe around us. So uh, thank you all very much. So thank you very much, Wes. That was very, very interesting. And uh, we do have a good set of questions already, but uh, people can continue to uh, type in their, their questions during this uh, question session. So let me start by asking, uh, why does the, since the person asks, why does the neutrino oscillation theory require that neutrinos have mass? One of the ways I think about this is that if neutrinos don't have uh, don't have mass, then um, in the reference frame of the neutrino, uh, it's uh, it's traveling at the speed of light, and time is never time is never changing. And so, according to the neutrino, it's just there's nothing nothing that would be changing ever. Um, and so, without interacting um, and just kind of travel just traveling along, there's nothing. There's, there's no way for it to have any kind of change that would happen to it. And so the fact that neutrinos do change and that, the, that we do see them change like this is, 
uh, sort of it requires that uh, that they have that they have this mass. So the next question is, uh, so what about tau um, neutrinos? You, you talked about electron and muon neutrinos, but what about tau neutrinos? So they yeah, so yeah, so tau neutrinos are really yeah, tau neutrinos are really interesting. So they they are um, they are much harder they are much harder for us to to make in our particle accelerators because it requires uh, it requires more energy um, in order to do that. And they're also much harder. Uh, they're also much harder to detect um, because the neutrinos themselves also need to have more energy for us to see uh, the interactions that would be uh, that would be able for us to tell that they were tau neutrinos, um, or to tell they were tau neutrinos most uh, most readily. Um, and that's just due to the tau having more mass. Um, and so that's, but uh, there's a lot of interesting ideas and thinking about, you know, ways that we can try to detect and do more with tau neutrinos in the future, because uh, by uh, checking, uh, by doing more measurements with tau neutrinos, we can test to see uh, if there really are uh, three flavors of neutrinos or if there's uh, uh, mixing into different other kinds of uh, flavors of neutrinos. Uh, a better measurements of tau neutrinos would really uh, would really help with that, but it's very challenging. Okay, thank you. So how much data is produced in a single neutrino detection event? You talked about total amounts and things, but what about a single event? How much data do you get? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so in Microboon, uh, we, uh, one event after, after doing some compression is on the order of, uh, on the order of 35 megabytes. Um, so it's kind of, it really is kind of similar to what you would uh, have from a, uh, like a picture. Uh, it's, it's not so far off from that. It depends on the, the detail and quality of the pictures that you have. But in Dune, one event is actually going to be uh, about uh, is uh, going to be about six gigabytes worth of data, um, and so it's it's going to be even even greater. Uh, I think I have that right. <laughs> um, so so yeah so so it's a uh, and these events you know they add up. So if we're taking if we're getting like one event uh, if we're rec taking and recording one event every every second, then you know thirty five megabytes or even a gigabyte every second is is adds up very quickly and uh, makes a makes a big challenge for processing all of that data later. So next question is, how do you deal with noise <clears throat> from all the detection wires? Are, are the neutrino events quite how high power and outscale the noise, or do you have a way of elim eliminating the noise? Yeah, so that so that's a really great question. So this is one of the this is one of the things that's uh, one of the most difficult uh, things in liquid argon TPCs because a lot of these complex all, all of the electronics and, and things uh, all of in, in different detectors uh, detector systems and you know the even the cryogenic pumps and and all of the other electrical systems in the detector can induce noise on on the on on the experiment because these are very sensitive detectors that we want to have the best possible sensitivity uh, in order to do the best possible job of reconstructing the neutrino interactions. So one of the, one of the things that, that, that we do is that the, much of the electronics um, that do a lot of the readout electronics are actually inside of the liquid argon, inside of the cryostat. And so by keeping the electronics as close as possible to the, to the wires, and also by keeping them really, really cold, that helps reduce the noise. Um, and so that's, that's something that we're continuing to try to push more and more close to the detector and inside the detector if we can, in order to keep those noise levels down. But the other thing that, the other thing that we do is uh, we do a lot of, uh, we run a lot of algorithms to then go through and filter out and, and clean up the noise from the, from the detectors. And so those images that I showed you before, let me go back to one really quickly. So this, uh, you, uh, this image here is not actually what the, the, what the raw data looks like coming straight out of the detector. This has actually been through some noise filtering um, and some offline uh, processing to kind of try to clean up uh, noisy areas of the detector. 
and even still you can see that our algorithms aren't 100 percent perfect there's some you know little bumps and wiggles on, on the right hand side here and so that actually uh that actually makes it a great challenge for trying to incorporate and use the tpc information inside of a trigger is because one of the things you have to worry about is how how robust your algorithms that look at tpc data in a in a, in a trigger are to the potential uh, are to the possible noise um and so being able to do some quick noise filtering and other methods to be able to reduce the noise in the trigger is also something that we're really looking at. Okay, very good. So next question is, who figured out how to use argon as the generation medium and why and how? I think the latter parts of the more important question is, why, why argon and not something else? Yeah, so so this was uh, so the the idea of using this liquid argon TPC for neutrinos was uh, was envisioned by Carlo Rubia, who is a Nobel Prize winning physicist, uh, way back I think in the in the seventies. Uh, and uh, why use argon is a is a really good question. So there's a few reasons, um, but so one of the key reasons is that because it's a noble liquid. Uh, when the ionization electrons are produced by charged particles going through, uh, the uh, those ionization the those ionization electrons can travel through the argon. They can drift through the argon without being recaptured, because all of the other uh, all of the other argon atoms, uh, being a noble element, they're very happy with the electrons that they have, and they don't really want to try to grab more electrons or anything like that. Um, and so it's actually very important to us that we keep the liquid argon as pure as possible, because if there's any uh, contaminants like oxygen or water, uh, those really like to grab electrons and to and will uh, reduce our signal. And so that's one of the key reasons why argon is such a good medium for this is because we can have we can drift the electrons over the entire distance of the argon. And if the argon is pure enough, uh, not all of those electrons will make it from, you know, to our detection wires. And then the other reason to use argon is that, uh, with respect to other noble liquids, is that it's relatively inexpensive. Because it's so abundant in air, then, uh, then we can, you know, get really large volumes of it uh, for, for not such an expensive price. And, uh, you know, particle physicists are uh, always thrifty when we can be, especially when we're talking about needing a really large volume of, 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 of liquid in order to do these neutrino detectors. Okay, so another question. What would you be, I'm sorry, would you be able to detect anything from a gravity wave event? Ah, that's a good, that's a good question. Um, of which I am, I am not the uh, not the absolute expert, but there there are um, you know these uh, gravity these gravity wave events are typically you know they're due to some sort of astrophysical phenomenon like black holes merging or or uh, you know neutron star mergings and things like that, and so some of those things definitely could produce a burst of neutrinos as well, um, and and so. It's something that we are definitely interested in doing in Dune is being able to try to do uh, correlations with uh, with uh, gravity wave detectors as well, and to and to start to probe that exciting physics too. Um, yeah, I'm not I'm not so much the expert, but uh, but it it is something it is something that we're talking about doing, and it's really exciting. Mm -hmm. So. Um... Can neutrinos be the components of dark matter since they react with matter very dark, rarely? That's a great question. So, and that's a question that we've been we've been asking for a long time. Um, so, uh, the neutrinos that we know about um, within our standard model and the ones that I talked about today are are not the source of dark matter. Um, so, um, but they have a lot of the same sort of feeling that dark matter does: is that they interact very very rarely. Um, and they're, they're kind of all around us. And so um, one of the things, uh, uh, one of the reasons that we're really interested in the potential for other kinds of neutrinos is if, those, if there are different kinds of neutrinos, if those might be uh, something related to dark matter or, or candidates for dark matter. And so, so that's, uh, that's something 
when we're talking about looking for different kinds of neutrinos, those are a lot of the things that we're uh, starting to probe and try to make connections to. So is there um, some related question? You think you would follow a similar data acquisition process to look for dark matter? Yeah, so so um, so yeah, so a lot of it, a lot of the data acquisition uh, 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 setup and, and such it, it's very common and very uh, uh, very common across different particle detectors. So there's a lot of commonalities. There are some there are some differences though, and that's something that's actually being uh, uh, being probed more and more. So there's um, some. Uh, dark matter detectors and some other kinds of detectors too can run uh, a bit, uh, can run more without triggers and can uh, basically try to process all of the data that they get um, on the fly, that they can do some kind of processing of the data and try to uh, interact, uh, sorry, uh, reconstruct uh, pieces of the data that are, that are most interesting and useful. Um, and, then, and then send those reconstructed pieces of the data off for you know further reconstruction and to try to look for the dark matter and things like that. And so these sort of streaming uh, data acquisition is what we call it, or triggerless data acquisition systems. Um, they operate, they, they, they need to do much of the same thing. You need to find a way to reduce the overall amount of data that you have. Um, but the way that they do it is rather than trying to decide and pick and choose which pieces of data to use, they just say, okay, you know, we can, uh, you know, we can sort of smartly reduce the data by, you know, uh, or reading out this part of the detector and calculating something really quick. And that's the thing we care about and we can get rid of the raw data from there. And so that's, that's something that some dark matter detectors and other kinds of detectors um, do and, it, and it's, it's really cool. All right, so, uh... Here's, here's a quick question. What's the year of that Telecaster behind you? Ah, <laughs> uh, very recent. Uh, <laughs> uh, it's a Stratocaster, actually. But no, uh, it's a, uh, yeah, I think uh, I got it just a couple of years ago. But I'm still learning to play. So it's a, uh, it's a lot of fun. It's a, it's been great during, uh, during COVID times to have, uh, to have a lot of hobbies to do at home. So, so it's not a vintage. <laughs> it's not a vintage. As, okay. as, as beautiful as it looks, it's not a vintage, it has a, but it has a timeless beauty to it. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm going to ask uh, just two more questions. Um, one is this, how is it discovered that bananas emit a million neutrinos a day, or how would you measure something like that? Uh, <laughs> yeah, so it just comes, it, uh, I don't know if there's been an actual measurement uh, directly of the neutrinos, um, but uh, it uh, it comes from a calculation of you know knowing uh, knowing the uh, uh, isotopic abundance of the potassium inside the banana and and the kind that would uh, beta decay, and then based on that you know uh, being able to calculate you know uh, theoretically how many neutrinos that it's producing. Um, so. Yeah, so it's the uh, it'd be it'd be fun maybe to put a banana inside a neutrino detector and see how long it took to see something. But the, I think the neutrinos will be very very low energy, and so they're they're quite hard to be able to detect as well. So it's done more from calculation and not from yeah energy. yeah done more from calculation. That's right. Yeah. All right. So the last question. So what do you consider the larger prop problem in future detectors: the generation of the particles or the data acquisition and storage? Ah, um, yeah. So that's that's a really that's a really great question, and um, and you know it's the uh, it's something that we're kind of probing on at all fronts. And so as we're and, and they and a lot of times they really go hand in hand. And so as we're thinking about the next generation of detectors, uh, it's both about you know the difficulty of making larger detectors with more intense neutrino beams and bigger you know bigger detectors, or with the, respect to the colliders, you know having a more more energetic and more intense you know uh, beams for the collision. Those are really difficult problems, but kind of directly alongside of those, then you know all of those things. Then when we go bigger with more energy and we need more precision, 
all of those things require more data um, and require our ability to handle more data. And so the challenges kind of all work together. Uh, as, we, as we try to do, make better and bigger detectors and better and bigger sources for all of, uh, for all of these particles, at the same time, uh, we're needing to do better in handling all of the data from them. And that's, a, that's something that's really exciting about, you know, about the future and, and thinking ahead towards the future of both you know, particle physics and detectors, and then also specifically about you know, the trigger and data acquisition inside of them. Hey, thank you very much, Wes. Uh, <clears throat> I don't think we've had had a, a lecture before on, on data acquisition, so it's very interesting. <clears throat> Some people have asked whether or not there will be a recording of this, and that we are we'll, do expect that there will be a recording. Thank you very much, and good night, everybody. Thank you. Good night. <clears throat>